We're doing an interview with David Frost. We're talking largely about human resource planning. So rather than me introduce your credentials, I know you've got a huge amount of experience and knowledge in the produce world. Where have you been over your career? What have you done, if you wouldn't mind just telling us? So my career started out in engineering. I did a degree in manufacturing engineering to start with and went into the automotive component sector. Right. Um, I became very, very interested in business improvement and business process improvement. But relatively quickly, I became far more interested in the people side of that, and, uh, helping to work through how people would want to buy into change, would be uh, uh, led in a positive way through change, looking at leadership capability um, and engagement. Mm -hmm. So I gradually then migrated my career direction more towards HR and right. people and organisation development. Uh, and then I've had, uh, over the last 20 years or so, a, a number of HR roles where I've been head of HR, for example, within the shoe industry. Um, in the, the shoe industry? In the shoe industry, for Dr. Martins, for oh. uh, a short, only a short time. That okay. was my first move really into being responsible for an HR function, which was very consciously part of my, my career plan to get that responsibility. And then I worked for Carlsberg for maybe five years, um, but I was really fortunate during that time to get very exposed to employee engagement and improving employee engagement and developing people and, and talent. Then I worked in distribution logistics with uh, Christian Salveston that became Norbert Dr. Songler and it's now XP Logistics, so that's gone through a various number of changes. Yep. <laughs> and then came into the produce uh, world. Um, and that was just over 10 years ago. And today I'm Organisational Development Director for Total Produce, which is a global fresh produce business. And my role is responsible for talent, succession planning, organisation design, and key recruitment at senior level. Okay. Okay. And Total Produce is worth how much? Let's give us an idea of the size of the company. The business uh, is turns over at around four and a half billion right. euros a year. And during 2018, made a significant investment in Dole Produce, which is a US based yeah. uh, a huge uh, produce business. Yeah. Um, and the two businesses uh, have both come, come connected through that investment. So, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a very large international produce business. Right. And how many people work for Total Produce? We have got uh, in the core Total Produce business uh, around 5,000 people around the world. Um, but of course, the business is seasonal. So, in, in different yeah. parts of the world, that number can significantly increase depending on what's happening around uh, the uh, season. Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in Dole, the business has about 35,000 people around the world, so it's a very large business, but very much vertically integrated, so that's a lot of people involved with producing product um, in places like Costa Rica. Um, before we started recording, David and I were talking about um, fitness, all about trying to get fitter. You've got a 10k coming up? A 10k coming up in March. In March, okay, and I'm trying to swim every day. So we've, no we've, we've got this connection in fitness that uh, well, we both agree that marathon might be too much. Definitely too much. Marathon's yeah, too much. Particularly our tender years. Tender years, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's too much. All right. Um, I went to the hairdresser the other day and said, can you cut out all the grey? You went where? The hairdresser. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, sorry, I missed that. All right, let's get serious. <laughs> let's talk about um, human resource planning. So I've got a bunch of questions here. Mm -hmm. Now, these questions are simply searches um, that have been put into Google. And we thought we'd get an expert um, with lots of experience around human resource planning and see if we could share everything that's in your head on this topic. All right. So I'm going to start off with one of the questions from here, which is, what is a HR strategy? Well, in my experience, the HR strategy is looking at the really big picture in the organisation and looking at the really big goals that need to be delivered, achieved for the business, looking out in the longer term. Yeah. So that's going to be unique to each organisation. And I think the important thing is that, the, that from an HR leadership point of view, we take time to really understand the business mm -hmm. that we're in, the marketplace we're in, um, and looking actually outside our marketplace as well to see okay. what changes are coming towards us. Um, and, and then coming back into the business to really understand 
what are the commercial drivers, uh, what are the organisational drivers, so that could be around talent or capability, for yep. example, and then we design the strategy around that. So it's really then looking out over the next three to five years, what needs to change and what needs to happen to ensure the business can continue to be successful. So for example, in our business, we're really looking at the development of our own talent pool, uh, and that links into our succession planning for the future at our senior level. Yep. And so a significant amount of our strategy around people is related to that topic. In other organisations, it may be that the business has to transform itself economically or financially in some way. So the strategy may well be different. And I guess if you're in the automotive sector today, we can see lots of examples around the impact of electrification, for example. Yeah. And that's going to affect the, clearly affect the HR strategy for that type of organisation. Oh, so the news that are of that swing, aren't they? That exactly, that's a good example. Wow. If you look at uh, Google, um, they, they I understand need to hire thousands of people a year. Yeah. Well, clearly their strategy is going to be heavily biased towards bringing in talent, finding talent yeah. and, and managing that growth. So uh, yeah. this is, I think, the key message really. It's, it's about what's particular to your, your sector and your organisation. So it's really understanding the culture, the values and so on that, that underpin the organisation uh, and uh, help to be successful today. And that's the other thing. You know, we, need, we need to understand what's helped to get the business to where it is today. Before we can actually really understand then where it needs to go for the future, you've got to have that, that understanding about historical context as well. And you said to me earlier, before we started this, that one of the keys was also understanding the business, being like a sponge, I guess, before you start writing a strategy, it's understanding that business. And that's right, and I, and I, I think in a way it's a, it's, it's a little bit like being an architect. You, you've got to understand the landscape yeah. that you're, you're in. Um, you've got to take time to really understand the culture of the organisation. And of course, in a large international company, you won't just have one culture. You'll yeah. have a variety of different views, attitudes and beliefs in different parts of the world that can be to do with uh, the country you're in uh, as well. Makes sense. But also, I think what you are certainly looking to do is to identify the common themes that will stretch across the business. And, and if you're in a particular sector, for example, in our case, fresh produce, you can often see thin, similar themes that connect people. Right. And if you can yeah. identify those, those strands, if you like, that's a really great way of helping to bring people together. So in our organisation, we work in the sector with some profit margins that generates a particular mindset around commercial thinking. Well, we need to understand that so that we can then help to bring people into the business in the future that will relate well to that, work, work, will work well with that environment, and equally bring people up into the organisation who will relate well to that. And that's common to the whole group, not just to any particular division or country you're in. Okay, so when we talk about HR strategies, we've got one which was around maybe the Google one you described, where we need to go get a lot of people. We've got one around produce, which is, we've got very slim margins, so we need to support the commercial capability. What other types of HR strategies might there be? Well, I, I think if we're looking at organisations which have a very heavy dependency on technological development, yeah. Um, yeah. for example, there are sectors that are, that are having to really seriously look at AI to automate administrative processes, yeah. I'm looking at the legal industry as an example of that. They, that business would need to be really building up capability in that particular arena. So the big bias then towards education, towards bringing in new talent when you need it, towards partnering with other organisations that are going to help you with that agenda. So that's another example where the strategy will be heavily influenced by the organisational need for the longer term. Um, Makes sense. So I, I think. Um, this is a, you know, an example really where you've really got to make sure you understand the, 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 the broad context of the environment in which you're operating in. Okay. So let's say we've got a, a HR manager or a, an early HR director, and they're thinking, I need to write some HR strategy. I've heard of these words. So they start by understanding their business and the wider context of the industry. Okay, what do they do next? Well, I think, um, it's really critical in that first phase of coming into organisation, I think it's a really good way of framing it. You come in, you spend time with colleagues, you spend time with colleagues that have been in the business for a long time and understand their views, their thinking, um, their view on what the business needs to be doing. You 
reach out and meet people who are maybe uh, newer into the business, so they've got a fresher perspective, perhaps, yeah. with, with a different point of view. So, but they're equally valid points of view, but you try and really understand those different viewpoints. So I think the important thing is you, you take that time, you understand it, and then what you're doing, in my view, is you're looking at two distinct aspects. You're looking at, one, how do I add value in the near term? Okay, yeah. Because it's important that our colleagues see, and the business sees that in HR we understand what the current issues may be, or the more immediate issues may be, and that builds credibility today. Okay, so, so we're not working on isolation with part by the yep, go back. And the other really important thing is that we're then understanding the law longer term, and we begin to put initiatives in place to deal with the longer term. So it's creating that balance. And you need to build that credibility, and I think that's such a critical thing in, in our area. So it demonstrates we're bringing value. So for example, it may well be that one area of the business has got a, uh, an individual, critical individual that's been in the business for many years that's coming up towards retirement. Well, we've got to deal with that now. Yeah. But we need to get the right person for the longer term. Yes. So we're gonna work on that. It may well be we've, we've got some, uh, some problems around performance in a particular area. It needs some talent to come in. We need to go and find some new talent. Let's get on with that and make sure we do that well at this stage. But then we can then begin to work on the longer term talent development, which yeah. might take two or three years to build up. Yeah. But we've got support from business because we recognize the current need and we've got support for the business for the longer term because we recognize where we've got to go. And I, I think talking business language is also really important. There's no good coming in, for example, and talking highly technical HR language <laughs> in a business that's very down to earth and practical. Yeah. You've got to keep the language practical, you've got to keep it relevant to what people understand. So we've really got to be sensitive to that, I think, as well. It's, it's very easy in any discipline, and HR is very, very much an example of this, where we can get excited about the next really exciting initiative. Yeah. You can go to an HR conference and hear people talk about the next <laughs> things that are going to be happening. But, it's, but I think it's our job to translate all of that yeah. and, and ensure it makes sense in the environment in which we operate so people can relate to it. And that's definitely the job of, of, of HR professionals or the lead to do that. Because there, there is a lot written about HR having a credibility within the organisation and having a voice. You clearly got a voice in your organisation. I know a bunch of HR managers who are struggling um, with that voice. So I can understand that they need to understand the business, talk the same language. What other advice would you give those HR managers that are struggling to get a voice in their business? Uh, my advice would be get really close to your commercial colleagues. Okay. Really understand their challenges, uh, understand what's happening with our supply base, understand what's happening with our customers, understand the PL, uh -huh. ask your commercial or finance colleagues to take you through that and understand it. So when you're sitting in meetings, you understand the challenges they're facing but can talk the language of the business. Yep. Yep. And you're able then to ask well-informed questions. Uh, so I think it's fantastic coming in and being able to ask what I call the daft questions. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as a chairman of a company years ago said to me, I actually, David, expect you to be a well-informed facilitator. So ask the daft questions, but, but do understand the context. Do yep. understand the issues in the business. So yes, keep an open mind. Main, maintain your objectivity, but really try and get under the skin of where, of where we are. And where you can, go in, Go on customer visits, go on supplier visits, to, to, to um, go to the conferences with your sales colleagues, to the, to the commer those commercial hmm. conferences when they happen, so that your, your, your brand product. And I think the other thing is offer your, offer your support to other functions to facilitate um, strategic discussions to support them. So for example, if you have a, a, a strategic review around commercial, well, offer your facilitation to, to, to chair that meeting so that you're facilitating, but also learning at the same time, adding value back, and building a different kind of relationship with your colleagues. And I think that's where our role as facilitator in the business can be really helpful, mm -hmm. um, but it gives you that opportunity to get close as well to what's happening in the organisation. Um, so they're the sort of practical that examples. Was, that's that's good. I, I had a wry smile thinking of some of the HR managers attending some of the supermarket conferences. I've never seen it, but that would be brilliant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. Okay, all right, fabulous. The HR strategy, you showed me earlier that you have a HR strategy for your business on your phone, um, without giving away any confidences, 
What, what type of things should someone expect to have in their HR strategy? I think you've got six points on yours. Well, I think the, the, the first thing is to ensure that the business has really nailed down its values and the behaviours that underpin the day-to-day -day and the, the expectations, if you like, around the culture. And that's really important because when we're looking at developing people for the future, we need to make sure that they will work within that environment. When we're looking at talent coming in from the outside, we similarly can make sure yep. that people will fit well, but equally recognising we want, how we want to evolve that culture as well. So, because I think really being clear about that, and actually certainly when you're coming in relative fresh to your business, it's a great way of just checking in with your colleagues to, to, to say, look, my understanding is this is what's important to this business, this is how people, yeah. you're expecting people to behave. Is that correct? Have I got that right? And you're just checking that. I think it's really important. So get that now and, and write it down and, and share it and make sure that that's clear. Um, then we've got to start looking at developing pipeline at talent for the future. And that, that is a long-term activity. So it's about designing initiatives that uh, help to identify that talent within the organisation. Um, we let them know that they're important to us. And then we start to build them and develop them for the future. And that's a mixture of education. It's a mixture of involving them with improvement initiatives in the business and coaching and supporting them. And that becomes a really long-term activity, so that's very important. Okay. In yep. parallel with that, you do then have to start to offer support development to, the, to senior leadership in the business. Because, of course, if you're developing people who are coming through the organisation, yeah. it naturally puts an expectation on some more senior colleagues as well. So you've got to do both in, in parallel. Um, and I think what's really important is that the development that you're offering and support you're offering to senior leaders has to be tailored to them. It's, some people are very happy to work, for example, in, in learning groups and yep. share their learning with others. Some people actually prefer to do it on their own and be more one-to-one. One -one. Yeah. I think we have to respect <coughs> that and tailor that accordingly, so that's very important. Succession planning is key um, and it links to talent, of course, but having a clear, simple process that helps identify where you've got people ready to move into the roles over the next year or two, but also where you have gaps, and yep. so that you can start to put plans in place to close those gaps. And that links right back into risk management for the business, which obviously becomes a governance and commercial issue as well, so you can start to really talk the language of the business from that perspective. So I think it's very important from, from a succession planning perspective. And then we start to um, be able, in the longer term, to have all those positive stories to tell around how we develop the business, how we develop people, and then you start to be able to build, really build your employer brand. Um, and I think it's very important when you start to go public on that, you've got real, true stories to tell, yes. so they're credible. Yeah. So I, I yeah. think they're just some examples of initiatives that are more immediate, uh, initiatives that become longer term, and how that all ties together to in our particular case, we focus on developing our own talent for the longer term, so retaining and developing our own talent. So growing term. from within. And growing from that, within, and, yep. and, and that's been a, a, an absolute key driver for success in the past. It's something we really want to make sure we do. And that's again, resonates with the culture of the organisation as well. And that's just an example of how you tie it all together. Okay. Why so important to grow from within? I think I know the answer, but I'd like to hear. Well, I think... When you grow from within, you're doing a number of things. You, you can bring in people to the organisation and genuinely commit to them that they can have a longer term career with the business. So it's very important when you, you want to retain people for the longer term, retain your talent. Um, in a complex international company, there's a huge amount to learn. And ideally, you'd be giving people exposure to different aspects of that business over a number of years. So that uh, in the future, you've got executives who've got a very broad and deep understanding of the business. Yep. So that's really an important reason why you, why you want to grow from Makes sense. Um, and I, you know, I think experience is very important. And people that have had a few good experiences, people that have had a few bumps in the road, and have learned from those. And I think that's really key. So you want the, the, the combination. That's not to say that you don't want to be bringing in outside talent as well with different perspectives and different skill sets. I think that's important within the mix. But predominantly, I think being able to fill those senior leadership roles from within is a more effective way of growing a successful business. Okay, all right, that makes good sense. So we've got our HR strategy, which has about six points on it. Um, each of those, I think you said to me earlier, has a project plan behind it of delivering the day-to-day. -day. Would you just expand a little bit for us, for those people who are thinking, okay, I've got my strategy, what do I do about implementation? How do I make this thing happen? 
So from, from my experience, the, the best way of uh, looking at that strategic picture, you, may, you mentioned the six points, for example, is first of all, I wouldn't advise working on all of them at once. Yep. I think, particularly yeah. where we have very slim resources, yep. it's a question of prioritising. So uh, for, in our case, let's take uh, succession planning as an example. So when we take that particular uh, long-term strategy, I then break it down into bite-sized chunks, bite-sized elements, um, and so it's about then what's the process you're going to be launching, uh, what's the story behind it, why are you doing it, what's the objective, and so that you then go out into the businesses and start sharing that with colleagues, explaining how it's going to work, asking yep. for their support. Yep. So it's very practical, um, it's action orientated if you like, um, and I think then you share with colleagues what the timeframes are and how you're going to go about it. So. Um, in, in my view, that's the best way of, of, of approaching it. And then with, you, with the biggest strategy, you can then point to where this is all leading in the longer term. So you've got the strategy there as a backdrop, but you've got these very focused actions that sit behind it. And similarly, with, with, with developing your own talent base, having uh, so, some very clear programs of activity that are described, that have uh, um, clear objectives behind them, uh, that are written up, very clearly, but also very simple and very digestible. Because one thing I find is with busy colleagues, busy executives, yeah. we really don't want to be sending out <laughs> tomes and tomes of information for them to read. Simple, clear documents, face-to-face -face time to explain it and talk it through is really important. Um, I, I, I never think it's right to moan about the fact that some didn't read an email because people get far too many emails. Yes. So, so, so we, I think again, back, back to practical implementation, it's about having that um, uh, contact time with colleagues, really sitting, sitting down with them, talking it through, listening to them, modifying the approach where you need to so it fits in with people's expectations. Um, and I think you've got, you've got some traction then, you, you, you can really start to work through. So that was going to be one of my questions, I can imagine some commercial people that I know who are, look, I can't be bothered with this HR stuff, it's all pink and fluffy, why should I care? So I guess it's, how did you get them on board, because you've clearly done that in your business, it sounds like some face-to-face -face time, of course, modifying it, so you're listening to them, showing that you're really um, making a difference on Sorry, they're making a difference to your strategy. What else did you do to try and get them to listen and understand what you're wanting to achieve? Well, the, the first thing is, I think if, if, if you want anyone to listen to you, you've got to listen to them first. So that's about building that form of relationship. Yeah. When you then go back, when I go back to propose ideas or recommendations to colleagues, it's linked to resolving a business need or okay. answering business Fair. need. Yeah. So it's practical. Uh, I think that's really important. And I think, for example, when we're developing people, the more we can link that development to adding value back to the business in parallel through what learning, uh, development pressures are all blended learning, but for example, getting people involved with projects yeah. where they can take their new ideas and their learning that we've provided and apply it back into the business on a project that's, that's recognised or where a need that's recognised. So an example of that would be in developing our key talents around the group, as part of that programme, I asked my executive colleagues, including the chief executives, what are some strategic questions you may have about the business where you'd like some fresh minds to have a look and come back to you with some recommendations. Yep. And when we ask those individuals working in teams to go and work on those issues. So they're not made up, they're real issues that the business needs to have, have a yep. fresh look at. And I think that's just a really good way of uh, adding value back to the business uh, and people recognising there's value in learning as well. So, uh, and of course, if you're then participating in that as an individual when you're going through the process, you, it's much more motivational to work on something that's real. And where, you, where, you're, yeah. where you're being appreciated for the work that you're doing. So, so this all sort of ties together really, and I think that's again back to understanding the business, back to having the relationships with colleagues, um, so that your the work you're doing is real. Another example would be if, if you're offering support to senior leaders in the organisation around their development, much better to understand what their challenges are, what is it? What is it that really help them? So, for some individuals, it might be coaching. For some individuals, it might be they, they really would benefit from going on a short course to yeah. have some new knowledge. Yeah. Um, again, it's got to be bespoke to them, and then it's adding value back. So, 
we also use 360 feedback as a process because um, it's important that not only does the individual get to have an opportunity to measure the improvement in their performance and their contribution, but colleagues also know they're being asked to provide that as well. And it gives some degree of visibility to the development around the individual. And so, so I think, again, it's this, it's this combination of, of, of approaches that you can use to gain support. You mentioned um, at the start of this interview that we can, uh, as HR people, we can get very wax lyrical about 70 2010 or blended learning and trying to translate that back. And I like particularly what you said there around we're not talking about 70 2010 or blended learning, we're talking about a project that solves a real business need. And that is part of the learning process. And I think really, you know, one of the things I feel very passionate about in the work that we do in HR is actually, first and foremost, we're business people. Yeah. So that's the first thing. Yeah. We happen to have a responsibility around leading the improvement of the organisation through people, through developing capability. Like that. That's yeah. really key. Yeah. So let's have a business hat on as, as first and foremost. We sit as equal members of the leadership team it, from that perspective. Uh, and it's no different from whether you're the finance director or the commercial director. First and foremost, you're, you're a leader of the organisation. You, you, we all have responsibility to understand the organisation at an equal level. And then we've got our specialist hat on. Yep. And for me, that's probably one of the key messages we have to get out to, to our uh, to our HR community. I'm sure it's understood, but it's important that we keep promoting that, I think. Well, there's a lot written on the web. Uh, I read something recently from Forbes magazine about HR directors struggling to get their voice heard. Um, and I think that's a great tip. Business hat on first of all equals. Absolutely. So we're talking about, um, sorry, we're talking about human resource planning. Um, you're very experienced in HR, very experienced in the produce world. So I'd like to ask you if we could put you here 20 years ago, you'd only be 11, obviously. <laughs> um, what, what advice would you give yourself, and that may help some of the HR managers that might be struggling? So the advice I would give myself would be to spend more time learning about the business and the sector that you're in, um, being probably less focused on HR techniques and tools, important though they are, yep. to enable us to do our job but to really focus on the business itself and get out into the business and connect with the business. So that would be the first thing, I think. So you know, that's that commercial thinking, that commerciality. And if I just challenge you to, if we made that practical, what would you go and do? So we've got a young David here and he says, okay, I got that, but what do you want me to go and do? I would pro proactively go out into, for example, the commercial function. Right. I would very practically connect with the Okay. Commercial director, sales director, whatever the role is in that business, or the marketing director. I would seek to spend time with members of that team and go out and visit customers and suppliers and Brilliant. ask just to go and buddy Brilliant. so I could practically understand yeah. what's happening yeah. out there, understand their issues and their challenges. Um, and I would, I would find opportunities to get involved with that side of the business. And I mentioned okay. earlier on whether that could be around facilitating events with that team, facilitating a strategic workshop with that team, um, to join meetings. And I think that's a great way of, of beginning to understand the world that, that, that those colleagues are, are involved with. And again, go and try and attend conferences that, that, that relate to that, that part of the business. It's very, very useful. So. Um, that would be one of my re real recommendations around that. I think um, that one of the practices and the mindset that goes with it that was very valuable to me and was a real enhancer for my career was developing coaching skills. Okay. Um, right. And I think that enabled me to, first of all, understand myself more and how I, how I influence, yep. positively and negatively. Uh, the sort of questions that are really powerful when you're in a, in a relationship with, with, with colleagues in the business that really help, first of all, them to understand something differently, but also help you as an individual understand something differently. So those questioning techniques and, and approaches are really critical. And sitting alongside that, closely to that, is facilitation. 
Yeah. I think within HR, one of the most powerful skills and one of the most powerful things we can offer to our value is facilitation. So that's being able to work with a team to okay. run events, run meetings, chair chair meetings, um, come in with, a, with an independent perspective, but with also with an understanding of the organisation to really help move move something on. So. I think those skills sit very closely side by yeah. side. Yes. So that, that would be, for me, the, 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 the advice, if yep. you like, to get in early on and develop those skills early on as well. Yes, I like that. Okay. So your career from shoes to produce, <laughs> uh, through a bit of beer as well, um, proudest moments. What do you look back and think, that is brilliant. Maybe three proud moments that you cracked HR for yourself. The, one of the areas that I was most proud of uh, when I worked in the beer industry, uh, we did a lot of work around improving employee engagement. Yeah. And we ran a, an engagement survey across 13 countries, so our businesses were, were working globally. And the business in the UK sat right at the bottom of the chain in terms of engagement. And so over a, a number of years, I was responsible for playing a key part in leading the changes that we made around leadership, communication, um, and behaviour that saw engagement really shift significantly up. And we, we, made, we made some huge advances in, in that area. And part of that as well was developing our talent and capability within the business. So I was very, very proud of the fact that we were able to um, take an organisation that was very well established through a very significant period of change but we could also measure it and see the, and see the difference. And that was, that was, was, was fantastic. And similarly taking that approach into the fresh produce sector, working in my, in my previous business, a very traditional sector, mm -hmm. um, very low margin, as, as we've mentioned before, um, where a number of colleagues really weren't convinced that this approach was really appropriate in that sector. Mm -hmm. um, and over a, a four to five year period, seeing engagement levels starting off below 40% and then climbing to over 90% in some of our sites. But what was interesting across a multi-sited business, seeing those changes happen in parallel and consistently across the piece was, was, oh. was a, a fantastic to be part of yeah. that journey. Yeah. So, so they, they, are, they are really proud moments. And I think in yeah. the past as well, when, I, when I've been very fortunate in having HR teams to lead and seeing some of those colleagues from those teams develop into very senior roles now in other organisations and we're still connecting with each other and seeing their passion, seeing them um, take these, some of this thinking in, and take it further in their own organisations is fantastic. So I, 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 love, I love those elements of my career as well, that you maintain those limits with people. That's brilliant. I, I read the phrase a little while ago that the best leaders grow other leaders. And that, that sounds like what you've done with those people. Well, I think in, I think in, our, in our world, we, we touch on so many different uh, parts of the organisation, in fact, all parts of the organisation. Uh, we're working from the CEO or MD, we're working throughout the board, we're working down into the organisation yeah. at different levels. And of course, we've got our own teams as well. And so, yes, it's very rewarding when you see you see some of those shifts happen around around the organisation, and you see those light bulb moments sometimes. I think where they might have been quite sceptical over something, but actually now they realise there is a different way or a different approach, and that that's fabulous when you get those moments. Thank you. Let's ask the tougher one. So, in in your career. A couple of mistakes you might have made, or just think, actually, if I had my time again, I maybe would have approached that differently. Just some lessons we could learn from. I think uh, in the past, where I, where I would have got very excited about a new idea okay. or a new initiative, and would have launched that out into the business without sufficiently consulting with colleagues yeah. to, yeah. to um, help their understanding, gain their support, um, and, and I think what, I, what I've really learned over the years is that from, from an HR point of view, we, we, are, we are here to support the organisation and it's so essential that the commercial operational leaders buy in to what we're doing. And, and I think where I haven't spent enough time on that in the past is where the initiatives haven't been as successful. 
Okay. So that would yep, be fair. that would be a key. Um, I think um, it, in the past when I've been involved with senior recruitment, and those moments when you I've been interviewing or being part of an interview panel for a, a key appointment, perhaps at an executive level, and I've I've had that doubt about whether that individual would be right for this organisation. That gut instinct, yeah. That gut instinct, yeah. And involved psychometric profiling, I've had the occupational psychologist all involved, yeah. and my colleagues have said this person's great and all of the data supports it, and they've had a great CV, but I still sit there and think, do you know what, in this environment, they, they, they're great people and they're high performers, but in this environment, this may not be right. And if I suppress that, if I suppress that instinct, yeah. and I haven't listened to it, I have seen failures around key appointments. And one of my big lessons, and it's something I would always advise anybody to listen to that, that little voice, because you know the business, you know the culture, you know your colleagues, and you know, you know what will work and you know what may not work. David, you were talking about learning and continually learning. And as someone in HR, I, I would expect you to say that. So we're gonna put you on the spot a bit and say, prove you're continually learning. What's your best book and why um, that someone should read in HR? The, it's interesting because one of the books that keeps coming back, uh, and I refer to it with colleagues, is John Cotter and Leading Change. Okay. And I first became exposed to that book when I was at Carlsberg wow. in our international development programme where we were developing leaders for the future. I was very fortunate at being asked to deliver a module on delivering successful change. And I used the Cotter book, the, the Eight Steps of Successful Change, as the basis for that module and then use practical examples in, in our business where it's changed either been successful or unsuccessful and we could then oh, identify okay. where some of those steps for example hadn't been followed and that's why the change program hadn't worked right. so it became our template in the business across the group for leading change programs and interestingly in, in, in our own work in total produce where some of my colleagues uh, leading change programs, I refer to this model, the uh, Cotter Steps. Right. And actually, it's practical, it stands up, it still stands up. And that's and, 10 years old. And that's oh, 10 years old. And, and, so. and if you actually just look at the world with the world today, actually, a lot, of, a lot of things that are happening, if you think just use that book and just use that as the checklist of how we covered all of those steps of change. Right. And when we might have missed something, you can just see the changes that are really kind of working out. So it, it, to me, it, it just it's just a super, super practical, uh, down-to-earth tool that we can use in business. And, and can you remember a particular step where you think that's the one that people keep missing, whether it's your business, other businesses, they... Uh, so I, th I think... At a, probably several actually, but the, the, ha having a, a vision that people can get behind. And yep. I think that t is essential. So the, the leaders yeah. start off by recognizing that here's the, new, here's the new idea, here's the thinking, but then building this coalition behind you as a leader that will support you in that change. And that support has to be in the majority. So we need to ensure that in our communication around the new, the new idea, that the majority of people are behind that idea and that's wow. the, the job of the leader. So that's critical and then we start to um, to look at what we you know why why do we need to change what's the burning platform if you like and unless that's recognized people won't, won't want to, to move from A, A to B. So and then Cos talks about institutionalizing the change so once you have moved from A to B then you've got to have a framework and a structure for ensuring that change sticks and that it's embedded. Okay. But in order for that to happen, people have to be behind it emotionally and practically understand what we need to be. Right. So okay. it, is, it is very much about the hearts and the minds, but again, it's, it's very practical. And I think if you're looking at a change programme, you could literally use this as, as your checklist. You know, have I yeah. covered that off? Yeah. Have I covered this off? And at each stage, just making sure that you've, you've gone through it very logically, I think, as, as well. So that's why, for me, it really stands up so well. That's fabulous. All right. Well, our last question, because we're coming up on time, and then we need to get you off for a video call. So the last piece is probably a summary around human resource planning, HR strategy, 
One piece of advice, one, this is, if you haven't got one, this is what you should go do. So for those guys out there who are thinking, I need a HR strategy, I don't know what it is. David says I should go do this first. What is it? Find the one significant change in the organization that will make the big difference to the performance of the business that your colleagues at, at the most senior level will understand and recognize so what's the one thing like that that they will recognize and then support them behind too and that kind of links back to kosher as well because you've got to have that absolute clarity of what's going to make the difference good. brilliant all right okay. we're going to wrap up david thank you you clearly understand human resource planning you clearly have a lot of experience and certainly in produce Thank you for sharing it with us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Pleasure. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs>